When uh, one thinks microfinance, one typically thinks uh, empowerment, poverty alleviation, and almost also of a democratization of the uh, financial sector. Uh, but in reality, in the last few years, there's been a very heated debate about whether microfinance actually works at all as a concept uh, to uh, help poverty alleviation, and also a uh, heated debate on some of the moral compasses of some of the micro uh, lenders. And to discuss this issue with me today, we have Jason Hickel, who is a fellow of the London School of Economics. So thanks a lot for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah, thank um, you. So Jason, you recently wrote a piece on The Guardian um, that basically challenged, let's say, microfinance as a concept and as a tool to alleviate poverty. Uh, and one of your arguments was that it sometimes does not work, but it actually sometimes even uh, leaves uh, some of the borrowers worse off. Uh, how does this come about? Right. Well, I guess the first thing to understand is just that... Um, all of the studies that have been coming out in the past couple of years have demonstrated uh, pretty clearly that there's no net positive impact from microfinance programs. So we've had a study coming out of the Center for Global Development, a big DFID study, and recently a study from uh, the Poverty Action Lab, all essentially sh showing the same thing, and that's that while in some instances microfinance does help certain individuals, and this is where we get the anecdotal evidence from that supports microfinance, um, as, as a, a sort of across-the-board issue, on average, it doesn't help anybody. And in many cases, it actually makes uh, the problem worse for people. And the reason for that is, uh, is basically that um, the majority in many contexts of microfinance borrowers spend the money that they borrow on consumption. Mm -hmm. And as a result, so in South Africa, for example, which is where I do my research, some 94% of all microfinance borrowing is, is, is spent on consumption. And as a result, the borrowers are, un are unable to, uh, to fund the businesses they may be planned on on putting up, and uh, so they have no profits to pay back the loans, and so they get stuck in kind of these layers of, uh, of a these debt cycles vicious of debt. cycle, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So in some cases, of course, the businesses uh, do succeed, but what happens then, quite often, is what we call displacement, where um, the businesses provide the same basic goods and services that already existing businesses were providing, and so they essentially just push those businesses out of the market, yielding n no net increase in employment or incomes. And what happens probably more often is the businesses fail. And the reason they fail is because uh, th they essentially encounter a lack of consumer demand uh, because the people in the neighborhoods are very poor and they can only afford um, basic items that um, already tend to be on offer. And so there's, there's really no customer base for them. So it's a lack of aggregate demand. And also, I guess, one of the uh, key issues in this context is the very high interest rates that some of these micro loans actually have. So when we uh, look at one of uh, the most controversial examples, I guess, of uh, uh, micro lending, Banco Compartamos in Mexico, um, it has uh, interest rates, I think in 2013, were over 100%. And I guess that is quite an interesting story because it is a very uh, profitable and successful bank as a banking entity. It has one of the highest return on equities, I think around 43%. Um, in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, the interest rates are very high. So is this one of the key issues uh, with the micro lenders? Yeah, I mean, it's clearly a very, a very big issue. I mean, it, for many people, they think of microfinance as kind of a, a charitable endeavor, but that's just not, not the case, especially these days. Um, a lot of the major microfinance lenders are, you know, profit-making banks. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, rates are extremely high, even among sort of more charitable organizations, they're very high. They're higher than you or I would ever pay if we went to get a loan right now for ourselves, right? And in some cases, they reach as high as 100 or 200%, mm -hmm. uh, which is, of course, impossible for poor people to ever repay. Exactly. Um, and I guess, as I said, your article is very critical of, uh, of microfinance as, um, as a tool uh, to alleviate poverty. Um, and, but actually, there was an article published by the American Economic Journal uh, that sort of analyzes six different uh, countries. And what they do say is, yes, it is true. There are no um, clear um, uh, evidence of, you know, uh, increases in household income, uh, decreases in poverty, or, uh, you know, improving uh, social indicators. But at the same time, they saw that there was some sort of a mixed bag of uh, improvements in terms of greater freedom of choice, in terms of where you want to allocate your labor, for example, or increased consumption in some durable goods, uh, or in cases also increases in empowerment. So do you think that actually we shouldn't write off microfinance as a whole, I guess, too easily? Mm -hmm. Because especially for groups like women that are at a disadvantage in some of these less stable countries, having e even that small increment in empowerment uh, could be essential. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question that, look, in some instances for some people in some countries, microfinance can work. There's no question. In aggregate, it appears not to work very well, but that's not to say that it might not help some people, right? Even if at the expense of other people. 
Um, and certainly, you know, it, it can certainly lead to empowerment in some kinds, some kinds of situations. Uh, whether or not it is a definitive empowering tool for women, the jury is really out on that. Uh, I mean, certainly it's important, obviously, that women have equal access to credit um, alongside men. Uh, but um, there's lots of data suggesting that, uh, that women who take out microfinance loans actually end up in, uh, in relationships that are even more abusive than the ones that they were in previously. And the reason is because uh, when they end up not being able to repay them, then they get stuck in you know, a deeper cycle of debt. And, uh, and this leads to kind of cycles of violence within the home. And, and I guess uh, the key issue here is that uh, one of the sort of arguments that you make is that, you know, their microfinance could be actually looked at as an economic and maybe even a political uh, quick fix for probably issues that are creating poverty in the first place that are far more sort of deep-rooted and structurally complex. And in, in your article, for example, you write, uh, structural uh, problems require structural solutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are these problems in your opinion and what way, in what ways should we be tackling them? Yeah, no, good question. Uh, so, I mean, for me, one of the problems with microfinance is that it regards poverty as kind of a problem that just exists out there as though it, had, as, as though it has no cause. But we know that poverty is caused by particular kinds of institutions and particular kinds of economic processes. Um, the most recent example for us would be the food price crisis that happened beginning in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, that um, you know, was driven by reckless speculation on food markets in the global south by Wall Street uh, banks and by here in the city of, uh, in the city of London, um, which pushed 150 plus million people in the global south into hunger. Right? That's by conservative estimates. And so what those people need is not microfinance loans, obviously. They need a fair financial system that's not going to speculate rapaciously on their food systems. Um, but the, the causes of poverty, in terms of understanding that there's structural drivers, we have to go back to like the 1980s, really, when structural adjustment programs were pushed on global South countries, 1990s as well, which to this day remains the biggest single cause of poverty uh, in the developing world. I mean, I, I think the stats now are that, uh, that global South countries lost in the region of $500 billion per year in potential GDP as a result of structural adjustment. Mm -hmm. So structural adjustment was excellent for Western institutions, uh, companies and banks and so on, but ended up being devastating for poor countries. And the problem is it's being, you know, the IMF has recognized this. The problem is it's being, uh, it's being continued under these new poverty reduction strategy programs by the World Bank. I mean, really, the question I want to ask is, if, the, you know, if, if, we want, if we're serious about solving the problem of global poverty, we have to look at uh, at sort of the, the basic unfairness of the global economy, right, and how that's producing poverty in the first place. So I guess doing the kind of analysis that you were doing, sort of looking at the net benefits of microfinance, it sort of pushes you to sort of question also the broader picture and to sort of dig deeper and look at why the problem that microfinance is trying to fix exists in the first place. So thank right. you very much for joining us, Jason. Thank Thanks you. very much. Yeah. Thanks.